So this is a 72-year-old male who I just saw a couple of weeks ago who presented with thrombocytopenia and a history of splenomegaly. Uh, on December 15th of 2006, he had an initial diagnosis of stage 4A marginal zone lymphoma with bone marrow involvement. That was the interpretation at the local facility. Uh, there was no lymphocytosis. The platelet count then was 120,000. The spleen was 15 by 14 by 8.7. I apologize for putting out the pathology here and the uh, radiology, but just for the sake of following it in the discussion, uh, I normally don't do this. By December of uh, 2009, so about three years later, uh, the CT was stable at 16 by 14 by 8.3 sonometers. And in June of 2009, the platelet count was 106,000. The plate spleen stayed stable by 2013. The platelet count was 76,000, and uh, he really didn't have any other follow-up CT scans. He was seen every six months, and his physician was retiring, so he came to see to see us. Uh, in May of 2019, the platelet count was 20,000, with a uh, platelet count of 72,000. He was asymptomatic, and you can see the uh, flow there. He established his care here on uh, August 5th of 2019. He was asymptomatic. He really had no sense of his spleen size, uh, which kind of surprised me. And because uh, on exam, uh, the, the spleen was uh, down into the pelvic rim uh, uh, by by exam and crossing the midline. And he's a he's a fit person who travels significantly uh, internationally and nationally and exercises regularly. <coughs> So past medical surgical history and non-contributory, the exam, the spleen was 10.5 centimeters below the costal margin and across the midline. His white count was 15,800 with a lymphocytosis and the platelet count was 68,000. Can we see the radiology, please? Jason Young, radiology. We have a single CT abdomen pelvis from August 6, 2019, where you can see his uh, spleen is quite large down to nearly below his pelvic brim. Uh, it's measuring 23 centimeters craniocaudal. And then we have a few lymph nodes here studded uh, throughout the mesentery. Uh, largest I got was 1.6 by 1.1 centimeters. And I'll stop there. Maybe, oh, we maybe we discussed the pathology. Yeah. <laughs> the pathology's not available to review. Yeah. <laughs> that was a long time ago. So, so the question is, um, uh, that slide shouldn't be here. Uh, how do we manage this particular patient? Um, he's not been treated. Um, and just put this into perspective for a few minutes, uh, marginal zone lymphoma in the, the paper that we put out, had in 2015 out of the National Cancer Database, 8.3% prevalence data. Um, marginal zone's a, a complicated disease in many ways in the uh, the Pharma Research Foundation just uh, co-sponsored a meeting with the uh, ELSG on the topic uh, uh, late spring. And this is an example of splenic marginal zone lymphoma. And if you look at, uh, this is an incidence paper that Jim Searhan from our institution was involved in. Uh, that incidence, 7%, but of splenic, uh, there are only 640 cases out of 7,460, or 0.2%. And if you go to the NCCN guidelines, you get the, uh, the usual treatment for follicular lymphoma. And we were we published our experience in massive splenomegaly, and that's an example of this in splenectomy. Uh, 222 cases, uh, only 12 were laparoscopic, uh, and 48% uh, were non-Hodgkin lymphoma. We looked at the outcomes of this. We only published this in abstract form. Uh, and 90 patients had non-Hodgkin lymphoma. The median age was 67 years. The first treatment, it was first treatment in 62%, and there was an improvement in pressure symptoms. Uh, and there's portal vein thrombosis in two. Uh, in looking at what the uh, outcomes were, uh, the median overall survival is 30, uh, 33 months. Uh, there are significant patients living out long, long term uh, in this. Interesting, three cases had some focal large cell, uh, so had evidence of transformation. 
Another approach could be rituximab, and uh, this came out of the resort trial of the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, and 71 cases had marginal zone. And the in interesting thing about this paper, uh, Michael Williams was the first author, where the median time to treatment failure is 4.8 years versus 1.4 years if you got maintenance rituximab. So maintenance rituximab in this trial with follicular lymphoma made no difference. And now we have the lenalidomide rituximab. Uh, this was a phase uh, two trial by Nathan Fowler, published in 2014, and 30 cases were marginal zone, CR rate of 67%, three-year progression-free survival of 87%. And the AUGMENT trial uh, uh, came out in abstract form uh, in uh, 2018 and uh, uh, the uh, CR rate was significantly different if you used R squared versus, versus uh, rituximab alone. Bendamustine rituximab is another option in the Rummel and Flynn uh, papers, and it's very hard to differentiate some of the marginal zone lymphoma data out of this, but the CR rates ranging 20 to 40 percent, and overall response rates very high. And then we have new drugs come along, and I think these drugs are the copanilisib, idelilisib, and duvalisib are, are, should be relegated to those patients who, are, who have relapsed. But you can see that the response rates are in the uh, somewhere between 50 and 60 percent uh, range in the duration of response, 22.6 months with copanilisib. And so, We'll open this up for discussion about uh, what we would recommend for uh, uh, the approach, uh, um, uh, consideration of splenectomy, consideration of uh, immunochemotherapy, consideration of uh, single-agent rituximab, uh, R-squared or other. Uh, we have no clinical trials available. Interestingly, this disease, and this came out of the, uh, co the uh, conference uh, that we just had this spring, um, it, it, Mar this case would not be eligible for a clinical trial because splenomegaly is not in response criteria, which is really fascinating to me. But this many, oh, we will hopefully move the margin, move the, the uh, clock on some things coming out of that consensus conference. So we'll open this up for discussions, thoughts. Tom, let me just ask, what, what are the chances of a splenic rupture if uh, it's uh, left in this guy? Well, I wish I knew, but that's my concern. That's why I think we need to do something. Um, and I don't know, honestly, of good data. The massive splenomegaly, there are reports, but in lymphoma and in marginal zone, I don't know of any papers unless anybody else does. I honestly didn't dig around too hard to look, but that's my concern. I think if he was in an automobile accident, uh, this is, uh, if he was on the steering wheel side, that, boy, he's at high, very high risk. Even with, in, even with a seat belt on, he's at high risk. I'll throw out a, a third option for you, since he's uh, 72, he's yep. pneumatic, stage four patient with uh, what looks like a local only problem right now. Low-dose radiation is another good option for these patients, uh, anecdotally, and in the literature it's associated with about a 50% reduction, uh, which if you reduce that spleen to about 50% of its size, it's probably pretty close to normal. The dose we would use would be two gray times two. Uh, other institutions do one gray weekly until it starts to shrink. It's another option if someone uh, lived close by, but it would be atoxic, it would be palliative. Um, the counts tend to improve when you do that, so it can be also used as a preoperative therapy if the counts are too low. Uh, and someone wants to avoid transfusion. So. Okay, very good. Thank you for adding that. Sure. Other thoughts? Uh, Sparrow, we haven't heard from anybody today yet. I believe he has a very big spleen, so uh, he and he has thrombocytopenia. 
uh, he will need to start treatment as soon as possible. Uh, I think any of the options of chemotherapy uh, are eligible, whether it's a shop or it's been the master nutuximab, but he will need to start. Uh, I will not go for split right away. I will try the chemotherapy. And if it works, then that's good. If it doesn't work, then maybe I'll go for split. Okay. Other thoughts? So, Tom, I think you made this point already, but I think it's a bears just reminding folks that he's nearly 20 years out from his diagnosis untreated, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think options are continued observation and drive carefully. Um, <laughs> or alternatively, I think the radiation option is a very reasonable one because what you really want to do here is get maximum benefit for fewest side effects. And although you could certainly give chemotherapy and you could certainly give rituxan and you could certainly do splenectomy, I think you can probably get pretty good mileage out of the radiation therapy without a lot of toxicity. Um, but you might actually find the patient's not all that excited about doing anything because he's gone nearly 20 years without doing anything. But he wasn't excited about the chemotherapy approach. Uh, you that's, might not be excited so about any approach. Well, he's, <laughs> we, we already know he wants to do, he will do something now, but whether it be immunotherapy or splenectomy. And I, he, I did bring up radiation therapy, and he wasn't interested in that approach. He's, uh, why, I don't know. But he, um, so. Um, but I do think yeah. it's worthy of, in my mind, Sort of, re, sort of readdressing that because I mean, quite seriously, two fractions uh, to yeah, get you a substantial improvement with all these other options as a backup thereafter, I think is is worthy of consideration. No, it's very fair. I'll go back to him. Uh, I, I just want to make a comment. I wouldn't go for radiotherapy uh, because he's, he's elder. He, he most likely will be uh, exposed to pancytopenia and it may be for a prolonged time. While when we use shock, it's, it's a very thing. I wouldn't consider it an aggressive treatment. He can to do it well. Okay, I appreciate, I appreciate that comment also. I think that this particular case points out uh, there are multiple potential options. These discussions with patients I find extremely difficult, actually. Uh, if you're presenting all the options, which I, which I did, I spent a fair amount of time with them two different days uh, uh, talking through things. And does anyone favor doing nothing? So we have two votes to do nothing. How many favor some kind of intervention? Doing something. Me included. Me included. <laughs> <laughs> I was aware. Okay. And I'm trying not to raise my hand about any of them. So I'll go back to the patient and uh, present the discussion to him once more. Um, and uh, I appreciate the, uh, uh, the, the, the discussions on this case.